How a Romance Novel Save the Galaxy by Ariana de Rote. Chapter 80, Plo Koon 8, Jaster 15. Plo stopped walking on hearing a shout. All right, they're all on the ground left. Let's do this, you boy! yelled the Mandalorian inside of a crowded side room in the Kriz estate in Sindari. The Mandalorians aside were standing in front of a hollow showing the face of Moji, the older teen from the Sundari Harmony School at the top, and the faces of five younger children underneath. The shouts of affirmation back at the Mandalorian were rather drowned out by the howling of the Mandalorian walking in their midst, but everyone seemed excited. Plo tilted his head in puzzlement towards Duke Adonai, who was walking beside him. You remember that young man from that awful school, Moji? Plo nodded. Well, he issued a challenge that no one could adopt him until all the 90s stuck in the school were taken care of. That was so mad of Carla of him that it made them even more excited to adopt him. So they're running a campaign to get the other kids adopted so they can claim him as their ad. I've been hosting them here since they've needed help navigating Sundari's legal and custody system. Lady has been helpful? Oh, yes, once they were reprogrammed, we had decades of evidence I am going to slam Almec with in court. Adonai seemed disappointed he wasn't going to be able to do that. Perhaps you could bring a suit on behalf of the parents whose children were mistreated instead. I think one of the lawyers I'm working with might be heading that way, but I'll bring it up. It's an excellent idea. Adonai sent a blinding smile his way. Plo had accepted having a cup of calf with the man now that he had reached what he considered the hardest part of any mission involving children, namely letting go of the children he'd bonded with. Plo had questions about Mandalorian culture and wished to gently inform the Duke that relationship with Jedi rarely worked out. After all his help and out of all the Mandalorians vying for Plo's attention, Adonai was owed an honest answer. They settled in a hole-in-the-wall cafe near the Kriz compound, occupied only by a distracted barista and a younger human working intensely on their pad while drinking from a cup of calf larger than their head. The Duke got Plo the unadulterated strong calf he requested while getting a mix that smelled like some type of nut for himself. "'Thank you for coming,' said Adonai. "'I'm sorry I wasn't able to come with you to Concordia, but I did hope you still remembered my request.' No thanks are needed. I appreciate the work you did here in Sundari while Faye and I were gone. The fact that the Duke had stayed to do his duty as a leader was a good indication of his character, in Plo's opinion. I did have some questions about Mandalorian culture, if you're inclined to answer. I'll answer anything you want to know, said Adonai promptly. Is Mandalorian adoption really as simple saying a single sentence? Adonai nodded. It is, though generally you get the child's permission first. Mandalorians, well, the ones who know their history, remember that the more Mandalorian crusaders forcibly assimilated children. So as modern Mandalorians, we ask. Adonai's face turned grim. The only times we don't ask is when the child is dead and you want the right to say their remembrances. You probably didn't see, but someone likely took that burden on themselves for the children that were lost on Concordia. What a bittersweet choice. And then I looked at him. You're considering it, aren't you? Swearing the result there. Yes, though I'm reminded of the same issues I had when I chose to be a knight rather than a crushmaster. I am just one, and the children are many. If I were to adopt all the children I wished to, the children wouldn't get the attention they need from me. That's a very Mandalorian dilemma said Adonai, though he only managed to keep his face straight for a moment after punning on the romance novel's title and broke into a jackal. He sobered after a moment before raising his eyebrows at blow. Marrying a redour who can help you look after more children might help. About that, just what are you expecting of a relationship with me? Asked Blo. The man flushed a little, but gamely gave his honest answer. I'm expecting you to be a second parent to my girls, and that we'll adopt a few more children. It would be nice to have a bigger family. I'm including any Padawans you want to take as well. You'd live here when you're not going on missions. Plo sighed. That is where another issue lies, then. I am bound to the Jedi Temple, and as a Master of the Order, I hardly have enough downtime to be traveling to Mandalore and spending time here on top of my missions. I would never be an absentee father. 
Adonai nodded, some disappointment on his face. I know you will never be. I have duties as well that take up my time. I just hoped we could find a way to make our lives work together. The man straightened and leaned towards Bo. But they did find a Jedi temple in the deserts near here. What if you lived there? Surely that would give you the time to have a family. A temple abandoned for hundreds of years doesn't become a working temple just like that, said Plo gently. Adonai was not dismayed. They're going to check it out today. Why don't you and Fago and see what Tarevisla left the Jedi? I have an eco-biologist who wants to go as well, so you could escort them. But I was curious. I could be convinced, but I can't promise you anything in regards to a relationship or the temple, Adonai. The man reached out and touched one of Plo's hands on the top of the table. It's enough that I'm still in consideration with the most eligible Jedi in Mandalorian space. I'll court you as long as I'm welcome. Let's start with friendship, said Plo. Of course, friendship should always be part of a relationship. At that point, the Marista delivered a second calf to their table, placing it right in front of Plo with a smile. On the house, they said with a wink. Their calm number was written on the napkin below the cup. Sindali had certainly become a more welcoming place. When Jaster, Jocasta, Jan, and Tade's Hadakron arrived at the front of Vizla's temple, the two Verde, who had followed Knight Cobre Zaid a few days ago, slumped against the sidewall of the canyon, exhaustion in every line of their bodies. There was dust caking their armor and staining the beige bodysuit of one of them brownish-orange. Beside them was the big pack the knight had been carrying with him when he left a few days ago. You know, you don't need to stay with Knight Zaid all the time. Suggested Jaster, feeling sorry for them. Yes, we do! Said one of them vehemently, the other just grunted. You could take this as an opportunity for a break, said Jaster. The one who was slumped over more sat him straight. That's right! I'm getting a speeder! Derek, no! Got the other in dismay. I'm getting a speeder and loading it with supplies, and if it takes off before I get back, you can stay with him and I will come find you. The other Verde shook their head in denial. If! Finished Tarek getting their feet. You can keep up! And they stomped over to the clear area and blasted into the sky. Why didn't you just use jetpacks to keep up? Asked Jaster. That's what the Jedi asked us the first night, said the bird, hanging their head. Jaster shook his head at the ridiculousness of it all, but left them do it. The troops he'd sent up to defend the temple in case Death Watch attacked had no doubt been bored during the Concordia campaign, but today they got their reward in a handful of Jedi gathering in front of the Vizla's temple. Plo Koon and Fay were there with the leading ecobiologist from the New Mandalorians. Plet and his assistant were also waiting, having speeded out earlier to find Knight Zaid. They were talking to him now. Jaster squinted at something on Plo's shoulder as they got closer. You've adopted a sigil, asked Jaster, gesturing at the area. Plo looked over at the thick yellow spread of lightning bolts embroidered on the shoulder of his robes. Satine was teaching her little sister embroidery, it seems. Well, if you like it, you just need to get an armorer to approve it, suggested Jaster. Plo Koon looked uncertain, but Jaster had to wonder how long the Jedi could resist the siren call of adopting foundlings being Mandalorian offered. Especially considering how much the Keldorian adored children. Jester rather hoped he did decide to become Mandalorian, since it would be nice to have some adult Danai following in their Padawan's footsteps. As he entered the temple, Jaster got the distinct impression that Knight Zaid was alternating between being annoyed at having done all that research and not knowing about Tati's cash, and joy that there was something so useful to help them restore Mandalore. Either that, or he was annoyed that the temple doors had been locked before now. This is much larger than he pictured, said Joe. The roots of the big tree in the center of the atrium crawled over the steps and across the walls. When I saw the cataclysm of my people, I knew the temple must house as many as it could, said Tardes Hanukkah solemnly. Joe looked troubled by the statement, but did nothing more than place a hand on the tree. Jaster noted many of the Jedi did the same. Knight Zaid even leaned his forehead against it, a look of peace washing over his face. They went further inside. There were rows of empty rooms with stairs going down and up at either end of a long corridor. 
Last time he was here, Jaster had explored downwards and found what he could call an underground plaza for martial training. This time, they went down a different staircase towards a room which was sealed with a large circular stone. There were indents in it which sparkled when the light from their glow rods and the light from Jaster's armor hit them. Jocasta was immediately in front of them, examining it intently. The night temples are parts of them often has ways of opening which are inaccessible to non-force sensitives, explained Jan. Can't we just ask Tare? asked Jaster. She'll remember that in a moment, said Jan with that faint quirk of his lips that passed for a grin in the stomach Jedi. Sure enough, Joe was back at Jaster's side, reaching for Tare's holocron to activate it again. They had turned it off after getting directions to Tare's storage cache. Jaster, Jan, and Joe were fascinated to find the sparkling indents were small pieces of pure beskar arranged to represent Mandalore's night sky 1,000 years ago. However, some of their companions were impatient to get inside. As soon as Tare said the beskar pieces must be depressed in a certain order following the constellation known as the Basilisk, Knight Zane had his eyes closed and hand outstretched, somehow intuiting the proper pattern. Master Plet and Plo looked disapproving of his haste, while Master Fay had an amused smile on her dark lips. Beside him, Jan just huffed and shook his head slightly. Jo looked like she would have slapped the knight upside the head if she were holding the holocron. The big stone rolled aside, releasing the scent of stone and stale air. Everyone headed inside, though Jaster was the only one who jumped when the door rolled shut behind them. He guessed it was to keep the environment stable for the seed preservation. Although there were some stasis chambers being maintained around the vault room, the boxes and jars stacked throughout pointed to more traditional methods of preserving flora, and perhaps fauna as well, considering he saw the body of a tiny sort of mouse preserved in a nearby jar. I consulted many scientists who might help, explained Tare in answer to a question from the ecobiologist that Jaster didn't hear. They said that insects and small animals be integral to the life cycle of the plants. That's not something non-experts often think of, said Plett. You did a very good job, Mr. Vizsla. Tare's holocron dipped his head in a bow. Larger animals be too hard to keep, but DNA, eggs, and sperm of those I could gather be in stasis. It be not complete, but cut or willing. You will have jungles again. Jaster and Joe were alone in his bed that evening. Jan had declined spending a third night, wishing to be alone after so much socializing over the past few days. Joe sighed, relaxing against him. Jaster was glad she liked to cuddle more than her public demeanor would suggest. Anything wrong? asked Jaster. She had been staring off into space for a while. There are two main schools of thought on visions amongst the Jedi. The first, and the one that predominates at the moment due to it being favored by Yoda, is that the future is always in motion. So while visions may be helpful, such as they were for the Concordia campaign, the very act of acting upon them might also cause the worst visions to come true. The second school of thought is that the Force shows us visions not to torment us, but to help us, or else why is it showing us visions in the first place? Proponents of that school believe there is a reason behind being shown visions, which sometimes means acting on them. This is where the two schools differ and clash. She sat up straight, having fallen fully into lecture mode. I believe it stems from the fact that the Sith have a method of using the dark side to send Jedi visions, sometimes across entire sectors or regions of space. So Jedi during the Jedi-Sith War were taught to not act on their visions of destruction and death because often it was a Sith trap. Yoda's teachers were veterans or direct students of veterans of that war, which is why that school of thought dominates the Jedi today. She smiled softly at Jaster. But I digress. The reason I bring this up is due to that other research I was doing. Tare mentioned today that he saw a cataclysm for his people, but Tare's people are both the Mandalorians and the Jedi. If he had just seen the Rahan... Why would he specifically make a temple rather than a safe living space for Mandalorians? What did your research find? asked Jaster. He felt a sense of dread at the answer. I told you that a no-attachment policy was neither disproven nor proven to be effective? Yes. Well, since I had to compare rates of Jedi falling to the dark side to the Jedi population, the results of that research led me to investigate the rate of Jedi attrition. What I found is that we are dying in far greater numbers than should be ever happening. In peaceful times. Jaster pushed himself further up against the pillows at the head of his bed. The Jedi are dying. Joe nodded, her face grim. It's worse than that, she explained the results of her research and the treachery of the Republic Senate. 
I just got another update from my former Padawan Tal on her continuing research. This has been going on for at least a century. That's... Jaster trailed off. A part of him was vindicated since he had been arguing the Jedi weren't sending their people out with enough support since his first meeting with the Jedi Council, but he had thought the Jedi were just overconfident in their admittedly considerable abilities, not that they were being deliberately targeted. What will the Jedi do? The Council is still debating, but we will begin to distance ourselves from the Senate. That includes moving more Jedi to Ansley and outreach temples. Vizla's temple stands empty, said Jaster, seeing where she was going. And you think Tari saw some calamity in the future where the Jedi wouldn't need it? Yes, and I can't see many of your people objecting to having a permanent Jedi presence on the planet, especially with Agricord gearing up for their project. But there is politics to consider. The Senate was not happy with our actions here on Mandalore, so we will have to tread cautiously. Jaster thought about it. We both know that my people will gladly give yours the temple, and your people will freely help heal Mandalore and Concord Dawn, but the Senate might try to forbid both. So why don't we write this up as a treaty where the Jedi are obligated to help in return for the temple and its lands? We could name it Restitution for the Drahan on behalf of the Republic, mused Jocasta, though that might make it seem we are responsible for the Drahan. That is an issue, said Jaster. But you do think there's potential in this idea, she said. I'll run it by Yarl and Mace, so they can pass it on to Terra before it goes to the castle. And we can ask Tare's holocron if he saw anything more concrete than cataclysm for his people, said Jaster. Yarn tells me our friend C- Saifadius is heading to Mandalore as well. He may have seen more of the Jedi's future than he lets on due to that first school of thought dominating Jedi opinions on visions. We should talk with him as well. Sounds like a plan said Jaster, giving her a soft kiss on the cheek. Joan looked at him, crinkles of a smile around her eyes. You were very attentive during my lecture. I think that deserves a reward. Jaster leaned back so she got a nice view of his entire body. Yes, ma'am. Not Mandalorian was not Ed's first thought. They had an elaborate hairstyle which would never fit under a boucher and wore a pink lab coat with lots of pockets. That didn't mean they weren't dangerous, though. Pointed at them with steady hands was a gleaming new verpine slug thrower, which was probably worth its weight in Beskar. But for whom? asked Yom. Did they, of course, they said with a wicked grin. And apparently Mandels. They made a dismissive gesture towards Nared. He kept himself very still in his borrowed armor. If they were disregarding him, he'd have more of a chance of rescuing Kiri while their attention was on Yom. How you suborned one of ours is impressive. Have you wiped their mind with the force? Not Ed bit his tongue to keep down the instinctive denial. You make it sound like Mandalorians can't work for Jedi at all, said Yom in a deceptively mild tone. I've been told they respect strength and shows of force, and Jedi are weak, they said. Only if you consider it a weakness to care. And here, Hyam used the force to pull Kiri towards him, even as Nared moved to throw his borrowed Beskar armor in between them, so the slug pinged off instead of hitting Hyam and Kiri. About others, finished Hyam. 